Welcome into Big Ten today. Appreciate you being here for a Wednesday edition. He's Purdue great Robbie Hummel. I'm the very average Highland Mills, and it is that time of year. March Madness is in full swing. Illinois and Purdue continue dancing into the Sweet 16, and it's so interesting this time of year, Robbie. A lot of pressure, a lot of eyes. What is this week as a player like between round to round? Well, it's really exciting. I mean, you understand just what's in front of you, and with the NCAA tournament, whether it's your first round games or even this time that we have now where you've got a couple days, the preps are short. You know that you have to get after things, but you have to be efficient with your time. But the one thing as a player that you, you always understand is that as you advance from the first weekend to the second, everything builds. You know, the, the media attention grows. The, the number of people at your open practice seems like it's just, it's way more than what you see in the first weekend. It's the best time of year, and it's a really exciting time for these players. You understand that you are two games away, and you are just a weekend away from making the Final Four. A lot at stake, too, for Purdue and Illinois specifically, is they look to do something that has never been done for both programs and win a national title, and that is today's big story. Now, in fact, Illinois and Purdue are among the top two teams in the nation with the most NCAA tournament wins without winning a championship. However, the Boilers and Illini look like teams that could end that streak based on the way they played in the first two rounds. Both teams just really dominating, Robbie. Let's start out with Illinois, the fighting Illini, coming off a 26-point victory over 11th seeded Duquesne. That was the fourth largest win in NCAA tournament play in program history. But the big question for the Illini leading up to this was, would their defense withstand the test in the postseason, six straight wins coming into the Sweet 16 yeah. matchup. How would you assess their defensive well, performance? Well, I, I think in the NCAA tournament, these two games, they've been phenomenal. He, he, the opponents averaging 66 points a game, only shooting 40% from the field. The Big Ten tournament was a bit of a mixed bag. You know, we saw how upset Brad Underwood was at the end of the Ohio State game because they came out of that huddle. He instructed them to foul. Nobody fouled. And actually, the Buckeyes ended up getting a look for a three that would have tied the game. So there have been issues all season long in Champaign with the Illini's defense. And even you look at their defensive efficiency rank right now, 92nd. And that, that is not <laughs> when you're talking about teams that make the Final Four and that win national titles. Traditionally, that's a number that's going to hold you back. Now, it's really encouraging to see that in the wins against Moorhead State and the win against Duquesne, the defense was on point, and when their defense is good, that allows a guy like Terrence Chan to get out in the open floor, 30 fast break points. They turn these teams over. I'm encouraged, but you always wonder with this group, will they revert? Because that's kind of been their MO. They're very talented offensively, but the defense has certainly got to continue what we've seen in the NCAA tournament. Illinois has the most efficient offense in the country. With that, they don't necessarily have to be the best defensive team, but they have to do enough, string together enough stops to close out games. Back to your point, though, about Terrence Shannon Jr. Is there anyone playing better than him right now in the postseason? He's averaging 31 points per game going back to the yeah. Big Ten tournament. I mean, I, you could argue Edie just because of his sheer yeah. dominance, but I think Terrence Shannon is a top two or three player in all of college basketball right now. Third-team All-American, I, I honestly think that he should have been first with, with his play on the floor. He is so electric in transition, but also in the half court, just his ability to get to the rim. He's a good on-ball defender. You know, we, we've talked so much about Illinois' defense, and rightfully so because it's it's been such a story for this group. You, know, you look at Shannon, you look at Coleman Hawkins, they should be better defensively. For them, it's about being assignment sound. It's about you know following the scouting report, understanding the scheme that Brad Underwood wants to put out there. But there's no doubt, Shannon has been electric. And when you're talking about the best players in the NCAA tournament, Terrence Shannon has been one of those. Another thing for Shannon Jr. and Hawkins defensively is just consistency. Because to me, there have been times where you see those missed assignments or those moments where they're not maybe there every single possession. This time of year, you have to be locked in possession every single possession when it comes to the postseason. Well, I, I thought the Nebraska game was a per perfect kind of big picture look at their defensive abilities on the year. The first half, Nebraska's getting whatever they want. They're getting open shots. They're getting things in transition. It just felt like there's no way Illinois is going to be able to guard them. You go in the locker room, Brad Underwood lights them up, <laughs> they come back out, and they're yeah. a different team. You know, I, I ran into Grant Hill at halftime of, I, I believe it was the Nebraska game, and he came out and he, and he goes, 
man, I have not heard someone yell like that. It, it brought me back to Coach K and the way that he used to yell at us and, and at me. And I just thought that was so funny because we all know that while Mike Krzyzewski seems like he can maybe be a docile guy on camera, he yeah. really got after those guys. So, so Brad set the tone, kind of changed the narrative, and then in that Big Ten final, they got enough stops, end of the game against Wisconsin. Even though the Badgers scored 80-plus points, end of that game, it was a different story defensively. So consistency is the perfect word. Can they be consistent enough over the course of three weeks and can they lock in and be disciplined and follow their scout if they can they can make the final four and even win a national title their offense is elite but the defense has got to be there and I think it starts with guys like Shannon and Coleman Coleman Hawkins who you talked about those guys have got to set the tone the big question is can Illinois show up both on offense and defense if they do this is realistically a team that could make a very deep run now another player who's been key in all of this is the Southern Illinois transfer Marcus Damask great footwork he can get a bucket in a variety of ways and there really was a switch at some point this season where you saw Brad Underwood make him more of a focal point of this offense when did you see that start to change you know I, I think it's when Terrence Shannon had his suspension they certainly had to change the way they were going to play and that, that played a big part into it but it's kind of out here where Jay Wright and Brad Underwood had a discussion after the Tennessee loss where Illinois went down to Knoxville and lost in a close one and Wright kind of convinced him that you know if you're gonna do this with the bully ball and you're gonna have Damas play you've got to go all in and, and they certainly have done that Shannon coming back adds a different dynamic in transition and certainly Terrence Shannon can play pick and roll but we see it all the time when you watch Illinois games man they're just throwing the ball to Damask and telling him to, to go to work. He backs you down. If he draws two, he makes a play for somebody else. If you play him straight up one-on-one, -on -one, he's really good at using that footwork. He finds angles. He's got a great turnaround jumper. He has been phenomenal. And, and I, I was a little bit surprised that he wasn't a consensus first-team All-Big Ten selection. You know, For one of the teams, he made it. For the other one, he was second team. I felt like with his numbers in conference play, with the way that Illinois played, that, that he and Shannon should have both been consensus first team all, all Big Ten picks. Another player who's been key and been, has been doing a really good job finding his way to the basket is Dane Danger. Perfect from the floor yeah. in these two NCAA tournament games. Has not <laughs> missed a shot. Why is that? Well, he can really score. And, and I give Dane Danger a lot of credit because this is a guy that when, when you're looking at how few minutes he got at times during the year, I mean, he was playing at certain games. He'd get two minutes, not play well, come out. And a lot of guys would pout, and a lot of guys would say, you know what, I'm getting the shaft here, I I'm checking out. He clearly has stayed in shape, he clearly has stayed ready, and as the narrative has kind of shifted here, and Brad Underwood has realized that, hey, you know, only playing Coleman Hawkins at the five is not something that I think maybe always benefits our team. For certain matchups, yeah, and Coleman certainly is effective as a small ball five, but teams adjusted to that and started putting their foremen on Coleman, and now you, you really lose out on the advantage he gives you offensively, and Coleman still had to guard five. So it, yeah. Danger's need has kind of reemerged, and he's stayed ready. He's been a good teammate, and he's been rewarded. He, he's been terrific in the tournament, 21 in their first round win over Moorhead State. Give him a lot of credit. I, I have a ton of respect for Dane Danger and his approach to the year, and it has paid off here late because he, he is playing great basketball. Well, the Illini are going to need Danger in their upcoming matchup. Third-seeded Illinois taking on second-seeded Iowa State. We're going to delve more into that matchup specifically later on in the show, but that's coming up on Thursday night. Switching over now to the Purdue Boilermakers, also dominant in their first two-round matchups, coming off a huge win over Utah State, putting up more than 100 points. Yes, it's Utah State, but still, this is not a weak team that Purdue was just able to pick up yeah no and that was pure domination by Purdue I'm really impressed with their approach to this as well you know you're talking about a team that lost as a one seed to a 16 last year against Fairley Dickinson and they come out in the first weekend they're playing in Indianapolis in, in front of a very pro Purdue crowd but to win average margin of victory 33 points per game in their first two games in the tournament is impressive Edie was dominant I, I just love the fact that they're coming out you can see it in post-game interviews, pre-game interviews, they are all business. I think this team has been building all year for this. They realize what's at stake, and it's good to see them come out and play the way that they did. It has to be a little bit of the monkey off your back because that that looms large. You know, that, that's one of those deals where until you kind of get the first one out of the way, and if that had been like a close – if that's a two-point game at half, you just have to think that the pressure would have been building in that locker room. They handled business, and they headed to Detroit, I'm sure, feeling very confident. 
our own Andy Cass caught up with head coach Matt <laughs> Painter and Zach Eady and was doing the interviews after those games. And they were having none of it when asked about the pressure building up given what happened last year. Purdue a top seed eliminated in the first round and not wanting history to repeat itself. But you have to imagine that's in the back of your mind as a player or a coach going into this tournament. No, it's human nature, you know, and it's been talked about so often this year. This has been the narrative of this Purdue team. And I think for the general college basketball fan that maybe doesn't follow the sport as closely, you say, well, this is just the same old Purdue team. They, they win the Big Ten. They get into postseason play. You know, they lose in the semifinals to a very good Wisconsin team who was playing good basketball. But I, I think that if you hadn't been watching, you would say, well, I, I think that this will be the same old Purdue team. This clearly is not. Their guards are much improved. Lance Jones is a big difference maker. Edie has gotten better, which to say that is phenomenal. He was pretty He's pretty good last year. Yeah, National um, Player of the Year. Yeah, no big right. deal. And he's going to be back-to-back -back <laughs> National Player of the Year, rightfully so. But this is not the same Purdue team. This is a battle-tested. Their strength of schedule is off the charts. They haven't lost to a ranked team all year long, which is really phenomenal considering who they've played. Um, they, they are, I think, ready for the moment. And you have to think with this game coming up against Gonzaga and then either Creighton or Tennessee, they are battle-tested and, and ready to go. And now you just got to roll the balls out and play the games. You made a great point about Zach Eady's improvements. I feel like he's gotten more criticism this season, yeah. even though he's gotten so much better. And yes, he's putting up similar numbers in the domination that we saw a season ago, but it's a lot of the things you don't see on paper, like his defense sure. that have gotten better. What specifically have you noticed about well, his game? Well, I think the criticism comes from people that don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I Fair. think that every, there's so many people now that have a platform that either don't watch the games or don't understand basketball. I, I love Matt Painter's comments. You know, we, mm -hmm. should, we should make everyone take a test <laughs> that's going to cover the sport. And if you don't get a passing we grade, pass, though, right? I feel yeah. confident that we, we would be able to pass. We'd be good here. His his conditioning is phenomenal. And, you know, I was watching some clips to get ready for, for the games in Detroit um, just last night. And there was a player who was playing against one of the teams that's going to be in the Detroit regional, not on those teams, but against those teams. And he was a big guy. And I'm watching him just play in the paint defensively, how slow he's turning, how slow he's changing into the floor. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, he does that with ease. And he's way bigger than this dude. He's 7'4", 300 pounds. He plays 34, 35 minutes a game. He changes into the floor. There was a play in their second round win where I was amazed at the way he got a defensive stop, ran the floor, Braden Smith hit him, and he gets fouled. Would have been a dunk. But this is this is 7-4 changing ends. You don't, you don't see that very often. And when you're being compared to Shaq, and I love what Shaq tweeted out or said <laughs> yeah, that he's yeah. going to be Zaquiel O'Neal. That, 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 that was good. And you know what? For him to hear that, that's saying something. But you're comparing mm -hmm. him statistically with Ralph Sampson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton and now Shaq, Patrick Ewing. I mean, what are we doing giving this guy criticism? It really is mind-blowing. He's efficient in the post. He can post you up. He stepped out and made a three this year. And, and not that he's going to shoot a lot of them, but you think about him maybe going forward for the next level. Mm -hmm. That could be something that's important. He, he makes his free throws for the most part. He, he has been awesome, and you talked about defensively the way he protects the rim. At times, he was a liability early in his career in pick and roll, but now in the drop, he can late switch, he can contain the basketball. If you do get by him, you still got 7-4 coming to put that thing on the glass. So he, he has had a phenomenal year. He's gotten better. He deserves to be back-to-back -back National Player of the Year, and it's been really, really special to kind of see his development. Credit Matt Painter, credit Zach Eady, but also credit Brandon Brantley. That's the thing, though, about making it to the next level in the NBA for Edie is developing maybe more of a perimeter game. You pointed out the ability to shoot the three might elevate him to that next level. But for this Purdue team, Zach Edie getting better this year isn't enough for them to realistically yeah. be national title contenders. Edie has to have players around him who can knock down shots with the way he forces defenses to collapse. What have you seen from this Purdue backcourt that makes you believe they could go all the way? Well, last year they shot around, what, 34% from three, and now they are the number one three point shooting team in all of college basketball. Not bad. K Kentucky imploding <laughs> in their in their first round game certainly helped that statistic, but yeah. they'd been one or two really for the better part of the last mm -hmm. month. That that's huge for this team. They they've always been able to get on the offensive glass. That has become a staple um, of Matt Painter teams. Certainly was not when I was playing. <laughs> but now that they've got this ridiculous size, that that's something they do. The guard play you mentioned, the maturation of Braden Smith, of Fletcher Lawyer, those guys have taken a jump. You bring in Lance Jones, who has been the, the kind of perfect combination of get out in transition, get to the rim, 
play with no fear. You know, that, that's been important for this group, I think. Those three guys getting so much better has been huge for this group. I think you also throw in some freshmen who are very talented. Their guard play is much better. It, it revolves around Edie, but those guys' improvements is why this team can win the national title. Well, Purdue first has to knock off Gonzaga in their Sweet 16 matchup that's coming up this weekend. Come a new era in Ann Arbor. Michigan head basketball coach Dusty May all smiles alongside women's head coach Kim barnes -Arico. May arrived on campus on Monday to a warm welcome and was introduced by Athletics Director Ward Manuel at a press conference on Tuesday. May comes to the Big Ten after six seasons as the head man at Florida Atlantic University. And now we welcome in Michigan head coach Dusty May for the big interview on today's Big Ten Today. Coach, thanks so much for being here. Really excited to have you on behalf of all of us here at the Big Ten Network. Welcome to the conference. This might be a loaded question right now, but how's it going? <laughs> Life is moving at warp speed, but it's exciting. It's, uh, you know, a dream come true and uh, ready to get going. Well, just Friday, you were coaching Florida Atlantic University in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Sunday, it's officially announced you're the head coach. Monday, you're touching down. It must have just been a whirlwind week for you. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's been like? Yeah, it seems like the uh, Northwestern game was about three to six weeks ago at this point. But, uh, you know, just evaluating, taking in information, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what are the, the most important things to focus on. Um, and, and it's always staff and roster, so we're, we're making progress, uh, but um, we have a lot of work to do. But, but like I said, uh, it's, it's exciting to be doing it at a place like this. Well, you mentioned a place like this. Why Michigan? Why now? What was it about this opportunity that attracted you to the University of Michigan? It was the Michigan winters. Uh, we've, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> You're a Midwest um, guy, so maybe you like the cold. <laughs> no, we we, uh, we we love we, you know we're Midwesterners at heart. Um, we we lived in this area um, and obviously revered the brand and all of the that goes with the University of Michigan and and uh, the the Block M. It just felt right uh, to to represent this institution in, in an area that we were familiar with, and it, it wasn't as if we were going in uh, without any relationships. We knew a lot of people connected to this place. Um, and, and we knew a lot of people in the area, so it, it made sense on a, a lot of levels. And also to be a, a, a Big Ten head coach was uh, something that um, I never could have dreamed of, and, but it's an honor, and uh, I'm excited to represent this, this institution, but also this great conference. For those who don't know you, coach a Peoria, Illinois native, also went to Indiana University, so familiar with some of the rivalries. You also pointed out that Michigan's legendary coach, John Beeline, helped have some conversations with you and really was influential in the hiring process. What did he tell you and what were some of the messages leading into you taking this role? Well, Kyle, and, uh, I don't know if it's a wiki or what confused. I, I was born in Terre Haute, Indiana, which is very similar to Peoria, Illinois, okay. but uh, I'm an Indiana native. Um, but what Coach Beeline, um, you know, we, we had uh, a great conversation on a number of, of levels. Um, number one was he explained to me why there had been slight dips in, in success and, and it made perfect sense. But all of the things that uh, others had, had said about this place, uh, the academic standards, we, we want uh, to represent uh, th this institution and, and bringing the right people in. Um, all of those things were, were of no concern. And Coach Beeline, uh, obviously, uh, he, he did something that, that's very difficult to do. He went to the national championship game twice um, and, and had great, uh, consistent tournament teams. And, and you look at the NBA players that uh, played here and, and whatnot. Uh, but, I, you know, I grew up watching his teams at West Virginia and, and clipping tape and studying him. And so uh, he's just done so much for the game, but also reminded him that when I became a head coach six years ago, he grabbed me on the road recruiting and told me of the responsibility that I now had at that time as a head coach. So um, we did dip into basketball a little bit, but it was more about the, the culture of this place and, and was it the right fit for them and, and was it the right fit for me? Um, but I was comfortable with, with every, every facet and uh, couldn't have been more excited. And, and therefore, um, I jumped the gun, showed my hand and, and said I, I wanted to be the coach. So, um, you know, it, it was a whirlwind, but I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Well, you had no shortage of success in your time at FIU. Six seasons led that program to a historic Final Four run back in 2023. But that was your first ever stint as a head coach. What did you learn about yourself in the game during that time that you take with you into this role at Michigan? 
just that you're familiar with with press conference, with with media, with all of the responsibilities, and you learn how to to delegate better, and you learn how to to use your time most wisely. Uh, we only have so so uh, so many minutes in a day, and we only have so many hours. So what I spend my time on has to be very calculated and uh, efficient. Um, but I, I learned so much about myself, um, you know, how I wanted to, uh, and, and I was continuing to evolve as a head coach. I was changing every year, trying to improve. So um, I, I do think that experience, not in a, a spotlight where I could experiment, I could make some mistakes and, and grow from them without the, uh, without the criticism or pressure that comes with it. So um, it, it definitely pr prepared me for this situation um, to be in this conference and, and representing Michigan. Now, something I also read, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you often rode a bike to work down in Boca Raton, Florida. In fact, a bike that you had for 10 years. Is that something you plan to carry forward with you into Michigan? And can that bike be winterized, I guess would be my follow-up question. <laughs> uh, well, I, I had intentions of, of buying a new bike, but I, I, I liked my old bike, so I, I never got around to it. But it does have road tires, and uh, in Boca, there, there are beach tires that are probably four to five inches wide. I think I might pick one of those up and, and test them on the, the, icy, the icy roads of, of Ann Arbor in the winter. But um, no, I, I don't think I'll be riding my bike to work anymore, but um, you know, the, the, the temperature's the, the same inside of a gym in, in the wintertime. All right, well, however you get to work, everyone's just happy that you're going to be there and excited to see what you bring to this Michigan program. I also read a great article that you've taken some things from European style of basketball. You like the player movement, ball movement in your offense. Now, there are a lot of questions still surrounding your roster, exactly what that will look like. But in a perfect world, what brand of basketball will fans see when they watch Michigan play? We, we pride ourselves on on uh, moving the ball well, uh, taking what the defense gives us, playing it with great pace while never uh, letting the defense get set. But, um, you know, I, I'm a big believer when it's time to, to play the game, the players are, are the performers. They're the, the people that uh, everyone wants to see. And so um, we give them a lot of space and freedom and, and creativity and uh, expect them to make great decisions on the fly. But uh, therefore, we, we need unselfish players who are also skilled and, and willing to, to play for something bigger than themselves. Else. But, uh, you know, at least this time around, uh, I, we have more than just a vision to sell to recruits. I, I've been a head coach before, so we do have a style of play and an identity. So um, that, that, that's one of the benefits of, of already being a head coach. Well, aside from the tactical side of things, you've talked about how important relationships are with the transfer portal. Sometimes it's like speed dating. I don't know if it's speed dating now for you as well, trying to get to know some of the current players, but just what have the conversations been like with players who are currently on this Michigan roster? That I'm excited to get to know them. And uh, we're anyone that, that plays here, we're, we're competing and representing the, the Block M. And so it's it's a partnership, it's a collaboration. Um, I asked all of the, cor the the current players to give uh, me and and the staff a couple weeks on the court, and then we we figure out if it's the right fit for them and it's the right fit for us. Uh, it's you know it's it's a different time to get a head coach in position where there's a, a lot of players in the portal. There's a lot of options for them. There's a lot of options for us but it's still going to come down to the right fit. But I know these guys here, they love this, uh, this institution. And so we, we're going to give each other a fair shot. And, uh, you know, we'll see if, if, if a couple weeks are, are, is enough time to, to develop real relationships. Well, Coach, real quickly before you go, I want to allow people to get to know Dusty May the person a little bit. I know you have a wife, Anna, who you've talked about, and three sons. The two eldest play basketball in college. Just curious, how involved were you in coaching them growing up, and does basketball talk ever end around the May dinner table? I wasn't involved at all, even with taking them to the gym. Hey, I'm here if you ever want to go get a workout in. I'm not making you this. I don't expect you to have the passion I have for this game. Uh, but they grew up around it. They love it. Most of our conversations uh, tilt towards basketball because of uh, their relationships. My relationships are usually connected to this game. Um, but I was the guy that sat up top and, and tried not to ever show any emotion positively or negatively. And so uh, because it was their thing. And if they wanted to play basketball, I supported them. But if they didn't, I was also fine with that. And they're well-rounded, uh, fine young men. My wife, Anna, did a great job. Um, but yeah, they're, they're definitely uh, immersed in this game. Very impressive. That takes a lot of restraint to sit there, no emotion. So there was no basketball in the baby cribs for those three either? 
there were ba there were basketballs around, yes, and uh, when around. you have three three children as quickly as we did, um, I had to to relieve some stress. So I, I would always take one or two with me, uh, recruiting trips to the gym for workouts, whatever. So they they grew up in the gym. Um, they just weren't blessed with with the best DNA to to play at a high high level, but they're they're good basketball players. <laughs> well, awesome, Coach. Thanks so much for stopping by. Appreciate the time, and once again, welcome from all of us here at the Big Ten Network. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Indiana graduate student forward Mackenzie Holmes back for a victory lap this season and certainly making her mark on the Indiana record book. Holmes is the program's all-time leading scorer, but she's been clear that she came back for a fifth season to lead the Hoosiers on a deep run. So far, so good as they advance to the Sweet 16 with a win on Monday night over Oklahoma. Now we welcome into the show Big Ten Network and Fox Sports broadcaster Sloan Martin. So excited to have you here to talk more about Holmes and the Hoosiers. First, let's start by going back to that second round really tough battle against Oklahoma. Two teams with very high-powered offenses, but the Hoosiers closed out strong down the stretch. What were some of your main takeaways? That this is a team that so depends on Mackenzie Holmes. She had 12 points in that fourth quarter, lifting her team to this victory. And you just see this competitiveness, this will to win under Terry Moore, and that has just defined her teams at her time in Bloomington. That even though it went down to the final minute, there were 29 ties and 10 lead changes in this game. It was incredible to watch, but it was eventually Indiana. You heard from Coach Moore. And after saying the team that wanted to win more came out on top and you could just feel that from Indiana, like you mentioned, one of the most efficient, high powered offenses in the country, leading them to victory. But you look at Holmes in the fourth quarter, she was not to be denied in that win. In fact, to your point, Holmes and Sarah Scalia outscored the entire Sooners team in that fourth quarter. Two players who came back for fifth years really wanting to accomplish something special with this Indiana team. What have those two meant to this program? They have meant stability. They have meant intensity, winning for this team, uplifting everyone around them. Sarah Scalia having this kind of season, really a bounce back season for her. Her numbers dipped last year, her first in Bloomington, looking more like the Sarah Scalia that we saw her last year at Minnesota in her home state with the kind of numbers and shooting that she's put up. She greatly had to put in a lot of work to see more of the floor have a bigger role on this team, particularly defense. Another thing that has defined Terry Moore and team. So she had to really reconstruct her game once she got to Indiana. And the Mackenzie Holmes, of course, I did her senior game broadcast as well. And, and just hearing the kind of emotions from everyone involved in this program coming from Maine and not really having that typical kind of connection with Indiana as a program or as, as an institution and just becoming enmeshed with what Indiana women's basketball means. And say so mentioned her intensity you could see at the end not to be denied someone who has just continued to uplift this team great players of course around her too but you see that legacy that she cares so much about and of course ending this season undefeated at home for just the second time in program history too you pointed out the toughness this team plays with the great defense under head coach terry moore and you get to spend some time around her and the team what type of coach is she and what stands out about her Terry Morin is an intense coach. She demands a lot of her players. She holds the bar extremely high and demands excellence of them. And that's how she's been able to really build this program from the ground up. Coach Morin deserves a ton of credit for the work that she's done in Bloomington to put this team on the map nationally, looking for another Elite Eight appearance after a couple of years ago, continuing to push the envelope further and further to get deeper into the NCAA tournament. And She's done it through recruiting. These are players that stay, that want to be here, who want to be defined by being Hoosiers. So you can see the kind of culture that she's built around this team as well, that players just want to stick around and be there for this squad. So a lot of credit goes to Coach Moore, one of the greatest, well, she's the winningest coach in program history for sure, but one of the greatest in the country for what she's been able to do, what she's been able to build, and certainly no slowing down just yet. 
Well, Coach Morin has done an excellent job leading this team to a sweet 16 now with that win over Oklahoma, but a tough draw in their next matchup. The top overall South seed South Carolina lies ahead. This Gamecocks team has not lost. Camila Cardoso, the head of the snake, but they've got four players averaging more than 10 points per game. What is it going to take for this Indiana team to do what no team has done yet this season? Yeah, South Carolina is a daunting matchup for anyone, no matter who you are or what conference you play in. What they did against North Carolina, I don't think anyone even saw coming. Their first two wins in the NCAA tournament by 51 and 47 points. Their bench outscored the Tar Heels. 51 nothing, and their bench has outscored 10 opponents, entire opponents this season. They are so deep, as you mentioned, a very balanced, unselfish team as well. This team lost multiple players last year to the WNBA and just reloaded in a heartbeat. But the difference in now with this South Carolina team, Kylan, is that you can no longer just pack the paint against them, play bully ball style basketball. They shoot threes. Indiana and South Carolina, both top three in the country in three-point percentage, but South Carolina, number one in defensive rating, number three in offensive rating. They are a very tough matchup for anyone. You have to defend Tahina Pow Pow along the perimeter, especially. She's amongst the best in the nation in three-point field goal percentage. She's the head of the snake with the ball in her hand as the point guard. But you mentioned Camila Cardoso. I know I am so excited to see this all American American center matchup with Mackenzie Holmes and Camilla Cardoso. Holmes has that finesse, that touch to her game. Cardoso, a great finisher, but tough to move. Very, very strong inside the paint. So I think it's going to depend on making sure she gets as few touches as possible and defending that three-point line, too. Well, the fourth-seeded Hoosiers will take on the top overall seed South Carolina on Friday afternoon. Switching over now to the other Big Ten teams still dancing on the women's side. The Iowa Hawkeyes heading into the Sweet 16 after a big and another tough second-round matchup for them against West Virginia. A really good defensive team. The Hawkeyes averaged more than 90 points per game. They were held to the 60s in that matchup, and they also came up with some clutch plays in that fourth quarter. What was the difference for the Hawkeyes in that second-round matchup? Yeah, it's weird to imagine Iowa losing a game where they scored nearly 30 points under their season average. They're one of 10 in the fourth quarter. Caitlin Clark 0 for 6, reminiscent of her fourth quarter performances and losses to Nebraska and Indiana. And they still come out with a win going down to that final minute. It really, the difference was the free throw. They're going to have to, I think, dig a little bit deeper for to get extra contributions as they continue to move on in the tournament. No one's looking this far ahead just yet. Colorado's a great team, but if you potentially foresee an LSU rematch as well, trying to get some more contributions, particularly off the bench as well. But you're right, Iowa having to grind it out, but it was plays like the ones I mentioned with Marshall and a falter players like that, making key plays and key moments that really turn the tide. Well, Caitlin Clark led the way with 32 points, but you pointed out the need for others to step up. Iowa's had different players at different points in the season go off. Hannah Stolke has that capability. Kate Martin, another player that you look to. Who are you looking to to step up for the Hawkeyes moving forward? I'm really interested in Sydney Falter. I compare her on the broadcast. I should say I call her a pest when I'm doing her games, and I mean that in the best way possible. She is just a menace. She is exhausting to the opponent, and that is exactly the kind of player that I think she takes pride in being, whether it is on the glass. She came into this season knowing that she had to Still a big role on the boards with the loss of Monica Sonano and McKenna Warnock. And she stepped up, had 14 when they played Virginia Tech early on this season. And that's continued to be really her MO or bread and butter throughout this entire season. But now the last couple weeks of the regular season, the Big Ten tournament in which she was named in the all-tournament team. And then now in the NCAA tournament, we are looking at the future, along with Hannah Stolke, of Iowa women's basketball. When you look at Sydney of Falter, so it's really exciting for her to see the trust that she has garnered from her teammates, from her coaches, to look for her shot a little bit more. She's still within her game, but you're seeing her blossom, her talent really come out and be on display on the floor. So someone like her, I think, is going to be really critical, especially because we still don't quite know what the status is with Molly Davis. The team's still optimistic they could potentially see her, but she has stepped up and stepped in really admirably. 
Well, up next for Iowa, it's going to be a tough test with the fifth-seeded Colorado Buffalo standing in their way as they look to get to the Elite Eight. The Buffaloes are much more balanced a team than West Virginia. They've got six players averaging nine-plus points. There's no statistical category that they're really weak in. What challenges do you foresee in this matchup for Iowa? Yeah, how about a rematch of the Sweet 16 matchup from last year, which even though it was a 10-point win for Iowa, was still really close and really tough, a hard-fought win for the Hawkeyes and a lot of the same characters on both sides who are going to remember that matchup and want things to potentially be different if you're the Buffaloes and on their side. But you're exactly right about this Colorado team. Their head coach, J.R. Payne, says, we relish being the underdogs. We love to be overlooked. We don't have any All-Americans on our team or McDonald's all Americans, I should say. No, five-star recruits. We are absolutely an unselfish team. It doesn't matter who gets the shine. That's the kind of team that we are really about that team basketball style of play. They are a team that's going to share the ball very well. They're going to want to turn the Hawkeyes over quite a bit. A very dynamic guard in Jalen Sherrod. Stolke's going to have her hands full underneath with Aaron at Vonley as well. And then Clay Miller, good as well. And then you have Maddie Nolan, a little bit of a connection from her time at Michigan, so they'll have a good scouting report on her, someone who shoots threes, brings a ton of energy on defense and offense and on the bench as well. So they're a very tough team to stop, very confident, very motivated, but I think especially they are the underdogs here. They are going to love to play that role and want to play spoiler against the Hawkeyes for sure. Iowa certainly going to be tested with Colorado coming up on Saturday afternoon. Sloan, thanks so much for stopping by. Let's do this again soon, but in person next time. How about that? Let's make it happen. Big 10 today. Much more fun to come with Robbie Hubble joining me and looking ahead to the Sweet 16 matchups for Purdue and Illinois. The Boilers facing Gonzaga, a team they beat earlier in the season back in November in the Maui Invitational by 10. But this Zags team much improved since forward Ben Gregg joined the starting lineup back on January 18th. They're up in almost every category. What's the biggest thing you're watching for in that matchup? Well, I'm watching for, for Purdue's pick and roll defense because Gonzaga is just going to throw so many ball screens at you with Ryan Nemhard, Nolan Hickman. Those guys, whether they're in the half court in transition, they will just flow into those those drag pick and rolls. And Purdue's going to have to be on it. They, they are going to have to really be on their ball screen coverages. You're going to see some drop, but you have to assume that Edie is probably going to be back there. And if Nemhard's got some space, it will be a switch. He'll have to contain the bounce. And I think the scary thing about Gonzaga is that you mentioned Ben Gregg, and certainly with Braden Huff, both those guys can pick and pop. Graham E.K., more of a big that's going to play in the post. But pick and roll defense, to me, is the biggest thing for the Boilermakers in this game. So the Boilers are going to face fifth-seeded Gonzaga on Friday night. That's going to be a big matchup as Purdue looks to continue this great run and the great play that they had through the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament. Moving over, though, to the other matchup, it's third-seeded Illinois facing second-seeded Iowa State. Big contrast in terms of these two teams' <laughs> strengths. The top defense in the country facing the top offense. This Iowa State team also really good at forcing turnovers, yeah. something that Illinois has struggled with at times in the season. You look back to the Penn State loss, yes. turned them over 18 times with their ball pressure. What are the biggest keys for the Illini to come well, out on top in this one? You mentioned the turnovers, and I think this is one of those games where Illinois not necessarily having the traditional point guard could hurt you. Now, it, it, for most of this season, it really hasn't. It's been by committee. It's been Damask. It's been Ty Rogers. It's been Terrence Shannon. Those three guys will have to handle the basketball. I'm really looking forward to we know Illinois wants to play bully ball from the wing. Iowa State's defense is very unique. Think about the way Nebraska traps the post where they're, they're going to get on top of you and then load up from the baseline side. Iowa State is that, but times 10. You know, they, they are just go going to make you so uncomfortable with their pressure and the way they get to the ball. I, I just don't know if you can do it. But with that being said, Illinois' offense is designed to get two on the ball. They're going to have two on the ball. I promise you that. It's can Illinois take advantage of those opportunities, skip it, and then play out the backside. Another question is, can Illinois take advantage of the rebounding battle? They're a much better rebounding team than the Cyclones, and that's an area where that can allow them to get out in transition. How big do you expect that to be? Well, that's huge because when you can go against a defense that's not necessarily set, this is the one of the elite defenses in all of college basketball with the Iowa State Cyclones. If you can play fast, your offense or your, your excuse me, your, your defense can certainly help your offense by getting out on the break. Well, third-seeded Illinois taking on second-seeded Iowa State out at TD Garden in Boston. That's coming up on Thursday night.
Welcome back into Big Ten today. Looking ahead to what's next for this Michigan basketball program. Great to just hear from Dusty May right here on the show, but there's no doubt the work that lies ahead is going to be difficult. This Michigan team coming off a last place finish in the Big Ten, their worst season since 1960-61. What are you expecting when May's team takes the floor next season? Well, you listen to Dusty May talk, and he says it outright. We are going to play a fun brand of basketball. There's no question you watch his FAU teams. that They are analytics-driven. They shoot a lot of threes. They will mix and match defenses. You know, I think one of the intriguing storylines of Dusty May taking the Michigan job is that he had three pretty good players that still have a year of eligibility that could potentially come with them. And when you're talking about rebuilding a program, the transfer portal, while you can lose players quickly, you can gain them quickly too. So you, you can flip this thing in a hurry. That's going to have to be their focus here early is filling out your roster. I think they have three or four scholarship players remaining at this point. A lot of guys have hit the portal. I, I think for Michigan, certainly, and this is not just for Michigan, this is for any program in college hoops with this era – What's our NIL situation? And we have seen with Michigan, can we figure out maybe our admissions to get on the same page as the men's basketball program? They had some problems getting some pretty good players into school as transfers, and, and that's going to be very important. How, how do you kind of meld all those things together? Uh, but I, I do think that Dusty May will play a brand of basketball that Michigan fans find enjoyable to watch. It'll be exciting to see exactly how he builds that program, the roster construction, all the other things that go into it. And then the culture piece is a huge one too. Yeah. Dusty May taking over for Michigan basketball. Another new face in the Big Ten, maybe a little bit less new, but new at the helm, getting quite the support from Ohio State incoming athletic director Ross Bjork. The AD shared this post on X after the Buckeyes fell to Georgia by two on Tuesday night in the NIT quarterfinals, but he's praising their new head coach Jake Diebler. Diebler had done quite the job since stepping in after Chris Holtman was let go from the program shortly before the end of the season, going 8-3 and three in his time as the head coach. And they had the opportunity to win that game against Georgia as well. Jamison Battle had the chance on that last three-point shot. But when you look at the job that Diebler has done, what is it that has allowed this Ohio State team to be successful under him? You know, it's funny because we always talk about opportunity for players, especially in pro basketball. Like, when your number is called, will you be ready to step up and take advantage of that? And Jake Diebler did that to the fullest from a coaching perspective. You know, you mentioned the record 8-3. and three. You beat Nebraska. You beat Purdue. You win at Michigan State. You're on the cusp of getting them into the NCAA tournament. And, and with the run they made, they, they truly were right there. I, I really respect the job that Jake Diebler did because there's so many times where an interim coach comes in and it just falls off the cliff. And, and that didn't happen in any way, shape, or form. He got those guys to believe. He got those guys to play with a real freedom. I, I think that the team had felt the burden of Chris Holtman, kind of his job status, being in the air. They, they played so free at the Big Ten tournament. They were right there against Illinois. He deserves this job, and, and I cannot wait to see what Jake Diebler does in Columbus. Should be really exciting to watch that Ohio State team. And when you bring in someone who already has a relationship with the players, you retain a little bit of what they already built. We'll see what you can do with that moving forward. Well, thanks so much for joining us here on Big Ten today. On behalf of my partner, Robbie Hummel, I'm Kylan Mills. Be sure to tune in tonight for the big show. And all throughout the week, we've got more NCAA tournament coverage coming your way.